Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. And uh, I have a couple things to talk about today. One is a study of older, overweight men shows that men who exercise have better erectile and sexual function. This isn't the first study, by the way, that shows a relationship between exercise and sexual function and dysfunction, but it is the, the first one that included a high percentage of African-American men who benefited from the exercise just as much as Caucasian men. So the senior author of the article stated that black men have an increased risk of many conditions that lead to erectile dysfunction, such as type 2 diabetes and obesity, and they also suffer more from sedentary lifestyles. So solutions for this community are a very welcome thing. Now the study included 295 men, an average age of 62. All of them were overweight or obese. A third of them had diabetes or a history of chest pain or heart attacks, and 75% were current or former smokers. Now this blew my mind. In the abstract for the article, these men were described as healthy. In what universe are men with diabetes, obesity, chest pain, heart attacks, and smoking considered healthy? Okay, is this what we've come to? And you, this is a healthy cohort. I mean, you got to be kidding me. The men were evaluated and assigned to four categories of movement, ranging from sedentary to highly active. Forty-four percent of the subjects were sedentary. Twenty-six percent hit the highly active category, but overall, the whole cohort was not described as really active. Now, this is another one that just amazes me. To qualify for the group labeled as highly active, men only had to engage in moderate activity like walking, cycling, or tennis for an hour, three to four times a week. So it appears that the definition of highly active is just as subjective as healthy, all right? But even so, men who engaged in more exercise rated their sexual function, both in terms of erections and orgasms, as higher. The researchers concluded that exercise is highly associated with better erectile sexual function. Now, studies have also shown that diet is related to sexual function. Diets high in animal protein and fat contribute to coronary artery disease, and one of the first symptoms of CAD can be erectile dysfunction. It's sometimes called the canary in the coal mine that says, hey, things are not going well, you need to do something about this. And the reason is that the tiny vessels that supply blood to the penis are sometimes the first to suffer from narrowing and damage to the endothelial tissue. Converting to a low-fat, high-fiber, plant-based diet has been shown to improve sexual function. And um, you might remember in Forks Over Knives, one of, the, uh, one of the patients of Dr. Esselstyn described that that was a common thing that happened to Dr. Esselstyn's guinea pigs, as he referred to them. So a combination of optimal diet and exercise can be very effective for both treating and preventing uh, sexual dysfunction. And by the way, male erectile dysfunction is very, very expensive disease. If you do some research on how much money we spend on drugs like Viagra and Cialis and the doctor visits to get those drugs and on and on and on, this is not an inexpensive uh, thing that we're doing here. All right, today we're going to talk about fish oil too. Um, and this keeps coming up. I keep getting people in the office that are taking fish oil, so I know that we have to keep talking about it. So according to the National Institutes of Health, fish oil is the third most commonly uh, used dietary supplement in the United States. First two are vitamins and minerals. Now the leading reason cited for either recommending, if you're a health professional, or taking fish oil pills as a consumer is to improve cardiovascular health and to reduce the number or risk of cardiovascular events. About 10% of Americans take the pills, which translates to literally hundreds of millions of dollars spent on the products. But according to a recent New York Times article, the majority of clinical trials have shown that fish oil doesn't lower the risk of heart attack or stroke. According to the article, there have been at least 24 very well-designed studies published in reputable medical journals, most of which included participants who were at high risk of cardiovascular events because they had a history of heart disease or risk factors like high cholesterol, blood pressure, or type, high blood pressure, or type 2 diabetes. In all but two studies, two of 22 out of 24 showed no effect in outcomes between participants taking fish oil and controls taking placebo. But the companies making and marketing fish oil pills have done a masterful job of marketing the pills to the public in spite of this. During the same period of time during which the studies were conducted, sales of fish oil more than doubled. Dr. Andrew Gray, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Auckland in New Zealand and author of a study on fish oil said, this is a quote, he said, there seems to be a major disconnect. The sales are going up despite the progressive accumulation of trials that show no effect. 
The fish oil story, to me, is an example of how new products and protocols in the healthcare field can catch on without supporting evidence using vague associations and infer inferences and then developing a story around them. So I'll tell you a little bit about the vague uh, associations and inferences used for fish oil. Fish oil contains two omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. Omega-3 fatty acids are reported to thin the blood and reduce inflammation, which is a factor in coronary artery disease. And in fact, the FDA has approved three prescription fish oil products for the treatment of high triglycerides. These facts were translated into a marketing pitch that promised people that fish oil could reduce the risk of cardiovascular events. Unfortunately, it isn't very difficult to get doctors to go along with this type of storytelling. In fact, many, if not most of the people taking fish oil pills were told to do so by their doctors, and they're still doing it. Hence the number of members coming in here that are taking fish oil when they arrive. And I personally know many doctors who still recommend it. The problem was, or is, that there wasn't much evidence to support the story at the time that the marketing machine got fired up. By the time the evidence started accumulating, showing that um, there really wasn't any good reason to take fish oil pills, uh, taking the pills had become a common practice. Even the American Heart Association still endorses fish oil. I checked it out. It's one of the references in this article. Of course, the American Heart Association also endorses butterball deep-fried turkey breast as an approved food on their website, too. I mean... You know, we can't count on, this group doesn't always follow the evidence, I think we can say that. The Times article quoted several experts who offered various opinions about the issue. One, and uh, you can't make this stuff up, one guy said that cardiology today is so effective that something like fish oil might only just have a tiny effect. Now, data obtained from the websites of drug companies shows that statin drugs, for example, have an efficacy rate of about seven-tenths of one percent, Angioplasty, no better off. Better, I mean, taking drugs is a better option. And I just told you the drugs don't do much. Bypass surgery, useless. Okay, I don't think that the issue with our fish oil is that the cardiology profession is really rocking with results these days. And the fish oil pills just can't have an effect. Um, Joanne Manson from Harvard Medical School says the jury is still out. Now, here's why she says that. She's currently conducting a trial with over 26,000 people designed to see if fish oil, vitamin D, or both together have an effect on cardiovascular disease and other conditions. Apparently, she hasn't been discouraged by the fact that studies have not shown fish oil to be beneficial, and it's not a whole lot better for vitamin D. So anyway, it's, I'm sure that there's lots of money in doing this kind of research. Here's the bottom line. Nothing's going to change. Fish oil sales are going to continue to increase. Vitamin D sales are going to increase, for that matter. Uh, research studies looking at fish oil will continue to get funded and conducted, and doctors are going to prescribe it, and tens of millions of Americans are going to take it. I mean, one of the most aggravating things for me is just evidence doesn't change practice, which is why we have to keep getting this information out there so that evidence can change your decision making. All right? That's what it's all about. And by the way, in the um, informed course I'm going to be teaching, we're going to be looking at a lot of things that I haven't talked about as much but need to be talked about. Things like genetic testing um, and, and diseases that perhaps uh, we don't spend enough time on like autoimmune diseases. So I hope some of you are going to take that course. It starts in May, by the way. All right, that's all for today. All for the week, as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next week with more news.